I mean, there's the running gag, right? Which is something that, you know, you share with your friends, you know, regardless of whether you're playing a game. And just jokes that you've got from colleagues that you can still break out after a beer and everything lasts like crazy. How far will you go to set up a gag? Like, how many years in advance will you break <laughs> I, I, I'm not a very funny person, so I don't really set up gigs. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any uh, actual jokes. I, I certainly set up surprises, but it's a different kind of thing. Different yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely try to set up surprises. There was an early, back in high school, playing first edition. Um, I still get a hard time from my friends about describing the grassy knolls and then attack them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I've done it since then, though. Um, I try to, I'd rather have that sort of humor and that sort of joke come out of what the players are doing and what they're laughing about than what I'm trying to force on. I've also learned that any kind of mushroom men, you will then endure two hours of fun guy jokes. So we'll do a couple more things, me asking you questions before we let these guys ask you questions. Um, it, are there any tricks or any, any sort of session by session things that you do to, to sort of break up the monotony? I and mean, do you ever sit down and say, okay, for this session we're doing something really different, whether it's throwing out the rule book or whatever? I mean, how, do you, how do you occasionally spice that thing up? Every once in a long while I've had one session where I've done something like that, where at the end of one session the players all got teleported away and they didn't know where. And at the beginning of the next session, I started just describing them different characters that they were playing. They were all together but in a foreign environment with different roles. And I didn't warn them or anything, so they had no prep. And I just took it on faith that they would roll with it. And they did absolutely beautifully. They didn't question it. They didn't start like getting, like, getting upset about it. I said, right, you know, you own this bar. You are the performer at the bar. You are the bouncer at the bar. Like, and, they are, they just, and they just ran with it beautifully for like two hours before one of them finally got a clue about what might be going on and it's kind of snap them all out of it. Um, not too often, but you know, often enough. To... I did a Groundhog Day session where uh, basically in the first combat, the players were trying to leave this town and they all got killed. And they were horrified. And then one of them was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so then you, know, you wake up the next morning and there you are, and you have to get out of the village again. And it took them the whole session to figure out how to get out of the village. <laughs> oh, I killed them a lot of times. <laughs> We go to the well. Yeah. <laughs> I would argue that pacing in an D&D game is incredibly important if you're trying to run a continuing campaign. That you need to have a, a kind of feel the tenor of your group and understand when it's time for a really hard fight, when it's time for a really easy fight, when you really don't want to fight at all, or maybe you just want a couple monsters who will surrender and beg for their lives. Um, when you want monsters who will talk to the party, and when you know you want NPCs who will talk to the party, or throw in a mystery, or throw in puzzles. Right? And the pacing of that, I think, is something that comes with time. But getting the feel for that, you know, before you get bored with one thing, throw in the next thing for the people who may, you know, may not love combat to be puzzling on. That's important. So, I have two quick anecdotes that relate to this, uh, specific to my game groups. One is the comedy that just sort of comes out of the misadventure. When something goes wrong, uh, what can happen? And then there's the things that I deliberately do uh, just to shake things up. The first anecdote is one where the character is similar to situations we described here they get their asses kicked. And in this particular case, all of the characters um, basically were getting completely beaten down, but earlier on in the campaign, as I want to do, I give them items, or they find items, that are quite powerful and potentially campaign disrupting, but I don't care, because it's always funny when you use them. In this case, it was a, it was a, it was a talisman that would let them travel back in time. Okay. And for a brief period of time. So, they're all about to get killed. One character remembers they have the talisman and they use it to go back in time to a point where they can meet up with their former selves and join forces with themselves <laughs> and, uh, and attack the bad guy who's kicking their ass again. So they run basically an hour back in time. Said, hey, we need your help. We need <laughs> 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 Exactly, yeah. yes. <laughs> 
it's kind of like they took the double party approach to attacking the bad guys. They each ran two characters, and they all ended up dying. <laughs> senses, gathered their bodies, and raised them from the dead. No. I took that player aside, and I said, next week, we're going to do something different with your character. And how, what do you think about your character going off and hiring another pen of basically misfit adventurers to try to get their bodies back, to try to accomplish what they couldn't? And you would lead this group. He was totally on board for it. So when they showed up the next session with their, with their characters, I said, you're going to play this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Uh, these random NPCs who are these, they were NPCs that I had introduced in the campaign, but many of them had, they, they were all over the board in terms of what they were. I mean, it was like a baker. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. But what it did was it created a moment in the campaign that all the players remember because it's just so different from anything that happened before. I got to play somebody different for a session that ultimately helps propel the story forward. And I wouldn't want to do that every week, but once in a while, any trick is a good trick. Do you, do you ever bring in uh, sort of fit players, somebody to come in and play? I do that all the time, special guest stars. My players are instantly suspicious of them. <laughs> <laughs> because the first time I ever really tried it in the third edition campaign I was running, I asked Dave Noonan, uh, one of our uh, former game designers, to come in and play this gnome who joined the party. He stayed with the party for about three sessions before he basically was programmed to betray them. Uh, and basically sell them into slavery. <laughs> so from that point on, anybody who I invite to play a special guest gets a special caveat, which is that you may actually be the villain of the encounter. <laughs> you just don't know. Uh, when I started the game and asked everyone what class they wanted to play, and I just but didn't worry about balance, and none of them wanted to be a rogue, so I invented a seven NPC rogue who has been with the party all 15 years. And he is, he serves two functions. One is as a kind of low wisdom Greek chorus for what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> the second is, whenever there's a guest player, I have a character for them. So that character has been played by at least half a dozen different people, and the spouses of some of my great players, and some people from out of town. Anybody who comes in who wants to sit at the table, I don't have to worry about introducing some random character like, you know, in the middle That's of the wilderness or something. I just always have someone that's tagged on the sheet. It's a very simple character concept. It's a little wisdom beat who likes to backstab things. Don't we all? Yeah, I love having guest players come when people are in town and you know, them sit in. And I usually uh, find some way to fit an NPC, and it's not the same person every time. I was murdered on my way to the river last night. <laughs> He played one of the monsters. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to questions here in just a sec. I'll ask one more question and then we'll toss to anybody who wants to walk up to the microphone. Um, listening to you guys talk about your campaigns, A, I'm really jealous I'm not in any of them, and if any of you wants to move to Western Massachusetts. You're only two hours away from me, I'm just saying. Um, but, but, but second of all, they all sound very story driven and not setting driven. And a lot of the D campaigns I've played in or witnessed can kind of be divided into those two camps. They're either about an overarching story arc, or they're about a place that people are either exploring, or they're taking over, or whatever. Um, is that accurate? I mean, is it much more about story for you guys? Uh, for, I, I think it's both. Um, I think that um, when you asked about what, what, what changes in the campaign, I was going to say nothing much, because a great adventure story has both courage and heroism, or the failure of that, and that just never changes. Uh, but for me as a DM, I actually find, kind of going back to what Kevin said when he was first uh, introducing himself, the discovery of the world is kind of the story of the campaign for me. 
That's the story that I'm invested in, and I don't really know what the world is until 